Hello, welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams, and here we are, 38 days away from Christmas 2017, and this is our very first show of our fourth season. So um, with that, all of, all of our archives are available on either Facebook or YouTube, facebook.com slash northstaroasis or youtube.com slash northstaroasis. You're welcome to take a look at a lot of our previous programming. Only the last year is on Facebook, but uh, most of the other archives are on YouTube. Anyhow, uh, what, what does this mean? 38 days away from Christmas and our first show of Season 4. What that means is we're a week away from Thanksgiving. And that's our Prager University segment for today. What's the truth about the first Thanksgiving? Food, football, and oppression. That's what Thanksgiving has come to mean to many Americans. Back in 2007, Seattle public school officials made national news by describing the holiday as a time of mourning and a bitter reminder of 500 years of betrayal. This new narrative describes the pilgrims as arrogant oppressors who fled persecution only to become persecutors themselves, depriving Native Americans of their land and their lives. But this is wrong on every count. First of all, the pilgrims didn't cross the ocean to flee persecution or even England. They'd been living for over a decade in Holland, Europe's most tolerant nation and a haven for religious dissenters. Free from interference by the Church of England, they feared seduction, not persecution, worrying that their children would be corrupted by the materialistic Dutch culture. That's why they risked their dangerous 1620 voyage to a wilderness continent, not because they were running from oppression, but because they were running toward holiness, fulfilling a fateful mission to build an ideal Christian commonwealth. They initially planned to plant this model society on the wild, wolf-infested island known to natives as Manhattan. But winds and tides blew them 250 miles off course, dumping the Mayflower on the frozen coast of Massachusetts. Somehow, the pilgrims saw their dire situation as a demonstration of providential power, especially after a giant wave picked up the flimsy boat of a scouting party on a stormy December night. The turbulent sea then deposited them safely, miraculously, on a little island within sight of the ideal location for their settlement. It was a deserted Indian village with cleared land, stored supplies of corn, and a reliable source of fresh water. No, these supposedly cruel conquerors never actually invaded that village. Instead, they expressed a fervent desire to pay the natives for the dried corn they found. If only they could find someone to pay but the former inhabitants had perished during three years of plague, probably smallpox, that immediately preceded the pilgrim's arrival. One of the few survivors of that devastation turned up several months later to welcome the English newcomers. Against all odds, he proved to be the single human being on the continent best suited to help the struggling settlers, since he spoke English and had already embraced Christianity. His name was Squanto, and he had grown up in this very village before a ruthless sea captain kidnapped him as a boy and sold him into slavery in Spain. After four years, he was freed by kindly monks, then made his way to England, and finally sailed across the Atlantic only to find his friends and family all wiped out by disease. Over the next few months, Squanto helped the English newcomers plant crops and negotiate a friendly trade agreement with the region's most important chief, Massasoit. No wonder pilgrim leader William Bradford called Squanto a special instrument sent of God for their good. The celebration, later known as the First Thanksgiving, actually involved a three-day harvest festival in October, apparently inspired by the biblical holiday of Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. Ninety hungry Indian warriors 
joined the 53 surviving pilgrims for this occasion. Nearly half of the colonists had died during the brutal winter. The Englishmen provided some vegetables, fish, and perhaps wild turkeys, while the natives brought five recently hunted deer as house gifts. The preferred sport on this occasion wasn't football, but shooting with settlers and Indians sharing a fierce fascination with guns. Though these hardy pilgrims loom large in the American imagination, they never built their Plymouth settlement into a major colony. In nearby Boston, the later colony of Massachusetts Bay grew so much faster that it swallowed up the great-grandchildren of the pilgrims in 1691. But the sense of purpose of the original pilgrims left a permanent imprint on the national character. They maintained unshakable confidence that God protected them, not to grant special privileges, but to impose special responsibilities. They saw themselves as instruments, not authors, of a mysterious master plan. Today, with our continued blessings so obvious and so overwhelming, the only reason to treat this beloved national holiday as a time of mourning is that some foolish Americans actually think that's a good idea. The pilgrims knew better. They understood that people of every culture and every era can gain more from gratitude than from guilt. I'm Michael Medved for Prager University. Thank now I will point out, since this is the subject of my historical inquiry and research, in-depth research, uh, for my master's in history degree that there are a few minor inaccuracies in what Michael Medved had to say um, But I'm not going to get you know nitpicking on the specifics. I could talk about it for the entire show today I am not going to uh, But for I would say about 95 percent 98 percent of that is correct again the, the inaccuracies that he has are so minor that they're really not really worth pointing out But I just wanted to point out that there were just a couple but um, that is true about the um, first Thanksgiving, the um, Wampanoag bringing five deer, uh, freshly, uh, freshly caught deer. Uh, and it was true about Squanto. Habamock was another uh, Indian who had also learned how to speak English that uh, Medved did not mention. But that's beside the point. The fact is that, you know, he, he's absolutely right in that they were instruments in a master plan, not the author of it. But I bring up Thanksgiving because next week is Thanksgiving. And for those of us who have been in uniform and served overseas, Thanksgiving also begins kind of a season of visits from the USO. So we're going to take a quick look here at uh, one of the earlier USO shows from this year featuring Scarlett Johansson, Chris Evans, Ray Allen, and a few others. One of the most special things about traveling with the USO is really being able to have a personal connection with each troop and, and really make them feel appreciated. I know a lot of people who have served in the military and I obviously play a character who is deeply involved in, in the armed forces. <laughs> it's about understanding other people who do things that maybe you can't relate to or that you just simply couldn't do. Um, and there's no denying that the military is always something that I've realized that I don't know that I have the courage or selflessness to do. And there are so many people who are giving so much of themselves in a way that affords me to enjoy an endless list of benefits on a daily basis. And I, I thought it was appropriate to give back. One of the, the greatest experiences I've had in my life is, you know, riding over the Hindu Kush. Uh, in Afghanistan. To sit on the back of a helo with my feet dangling outside was mind-boggling. Uh, it was uh, it was breathtaking. Uh, one of those things I'll remember forever. I mean, I appreciated it before, but I, I, I feel deeply connected to it now. And having served in the United States Air Force, deployed to Kuwait, Oman, and Iraq from uh, 2002 to 2004, I deeply appreciate the USO. The, we had a few USO shows that were going on when I was there. 
And unfortunately, I wasn't able to, I didn't have enough time to pull up video from one of those. Uh, but I am going to show you real quick um, a 2003 um, USO tour with Leanne Tweeden, Kid Rock, Robert De Niro, and Gary Sinise. I did not see this show. There was another one uh, that took place a short time after that I was privy to. So let's just take a, qu a quick look at this one, and then I'll uh, elaborate a little bit more. According to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, at least 25% of American women... Okay, so that video, was the, the one that I was looking at was... Uh, that was not the right one, so we're going to try to get that one. So I, I will tell you this, that you get a chance to meet a lot of these entertainers, uh, and then you get some of them who are absolutely stunning. And by that, I mean, you know, be with a few thousand other guys on a base, and then you have Leanne Tweeden show up. Uh, I mean, she is absolutely stunning, and probably even more so the fact that, you know, <laughs> you're a bunch of guys in, in, a, in a, uh, a combat zone. But the fact is, we're still very, very respectful. Now, we may think some impure thoughts uh, but, and have fantasies because you're a guy. Um, but what you don't do is you don't cross the line. And what is that line? That line is keep your hands to yourself, keep your mouth to yourself. Um, so you can go ahead and you know, think about certain things, but what you don't do is act upon them. And you, you just don't. Um, but I will tell you that I had that celebrity crush on Leanne Tweeden. I'm not going to dispute that. Um, but, you know, when I was around her, I was extremely professional. Besides, she's out of my league. Uh, you know, none of us there who were there at that time, I mean, we all knew she's way out of our league. Um, and I don't think any service person in the, in, the, in the Middle East, in the combat zone, ever thinks there's an opportunity to be with any of these people. We're all realists. that We know. Um, but, you know, the fact is it, it was just great, just not so much for Leanne Tweeden, but just the USO experience. I mean, I had done a show earlier on uh, Robin Williams, and, you know, Robin Williams was there, um, I'm trying to remember who else was on that one. I th yeah, Leanne Tweeden was on that one. Uh, a couple of Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders were there. Um, no, I, actually, that was a different. I, there were a couple of different USO shows that I was with. But uh, I, I spent actually more time with Robin Williams than I did Leanne Tweeden. Um, but it, it was just, again, it was great having them show up to show their appreciation. And this, this is what we're going to be doing now for any troops who are deployed. The USO is dispatching uh, people. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff goes right, after th or right around Thanksgiving. And it really brightens the mood of the troops. It really, really does. And we, especially when you're under a lot of stress and strain over there, we really need you know, that type of entertainment. So I guess we do have that video queued up now. So we're going to show you the 2003 U uh, Iraq USO tour. We understand your sacrifice, the sacrifice of yourselves, your families, your children. And we just came over here because we wanted to say thank you in person 
So I'm glad we were able to put together this concert. General Franks, everybody at the USO, the AFE, all the sponsors, it means a lot to us, and we're glad you guys are having a good time. with their passion and their discipline and their spirit and, and their commitment, you know, I, I, it's just, you know, something to, to work towards, to try to be like these guys. It's just been really one of the most exciting times of my life. This is the first time I've actually come on a USO tour, tour and uh, it's going to be the first of many. I've, I've, I've learned a lot and, and I respect these people. They're real American heroes. And so what is reality? The reality for somebody who's on post or on base and under a lot of stress and strain, a lot of combat patrols and in the case of some people, a lot of rocket attacks in the case of me, uh, you, you, you go through exhaustion and you hit your breaking point and then the USO comes in and entertains you for a couple of hours. And just to have that as a stress reliever and be able to just enjoy something for a change is it just tells me that there's so the USO tours are so vital to the mental health and stability of our people who are serving over there. And I really still to this day do appreciate every single one of those shows that they and Armed Forces uh, Entertainment uh, brought to us. A lot of fabulous people, great entertainers, and it really helped us keep it together mentally over there enough to continue to do our jobs. And so I'm deeply in, in, in great uh, gratitude and thankful for the USO for what they were able to provide in 2002, 2003, and 2004. But what happens when things cross the line? They have. Um, let's take a, a quick look here at our U.S. Senator Al Franken. This is a statement he made on March 6, 2017, just a few months ago on the floor of the U.S. Senate. According to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, at least 25% of American women say they have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace. And recent high-profile re revelations about abuse, for example, former Fox News chairman Roger Ailes' abuse of his employees, as well as the allegations of sex bias at Kay and Sterling Jewelers, demonstrate that we are far from addressing this issue on a broader scale. So I urge my Republican colleagues to reconsider their support for this resolution. I urge them not to force vulnerable women who have been wronged into the dark. And that was Senator Al Franken. Uh, earlier this year. If you notice, he looked a little uncomfortable there talking about that. Well, he was also uncomfortable in 2010 when he was speaking about one person who I had already mentioned. And during the show, I, would, I was kind of a co-host with a, a beautiful um, woman named um, Leanne Tweeden, and we'd do comedy routines, and we'd introduce the music, we'd introduce the, the cheerleaders. I'd go out and do a monologue, and this is something I would do, I'd done for a number of years. Daryl Issa, Congress. So keep in mind something that happened with Al Franken. And I'm trying to make sure I get it right here, so I'm going to be very deliberate in, in my approach here. First of all, I was at the Minneapolis Convention Center, or one of the hotels nearby, in June of 2006. There was a hospitality suite open, or a few of them, for um, 
um, people at the Republican state convention that year. Uh, Mark Kennedy had just gotten the endorsement for U.S. Senate from the state Republican Party. I was up at the convention center and, uh, and visiting some friends of mine in a hospitality suite late at night. It's probably 11 o'clock at night. And Al Franken walks in. Well, everybody knows Al Franken's a Democrat. What's he doing at a Republican uh, deal at the, con uh, at the hotel? There are probably about maybe seven, eight, maybe a dozen of us who were sitting back, friends of mine, you know, had a couple of beers, not, nothing too outrageous. Uh, everyone was still relatively sober. And Al Franken walks in in June of 2006, and he announces to all of us that he just wanted to come out and check out uh, what we were up to because he's going to run against Norm Coleman in 2008 that he was serious about. He's going to run for U.S. Senate against Norm Coleman. So he just came, came over to just check people out and see what's going on. We knew in June of 2006 that Al Franken was going to run for U.S. Senate in 2008. When he made his announcement, it came as no surprise because he had told a bunch of us there that he was not kidding, that he was going to run for the U.S. Senate. June 2006. What happened in December of 2006? He went on a USO show with Leanne Tweeden and crossed the line. Here is Leanne Tweeden discussing her experiences with Al Franken on that December of 06 USO tour about six months, five, six months after he had told us that he was going to run for U.S. Senate. Al, you should have known better. When Daryl Issa we had on just this week said, it's time to name names. And we couldn't agree more. A few weeks ago, our very own Leanne Tweeden uh, posted on social media, hashtag me too, and left it at that. As so many thousands and thousands of women have been posting me too in the aftermath of the Harvey Weinstein uh, debacle. And today is the day that uh, Leanne has chosen to actually tell her story and name names. Leanne, first of all, we're so proud of you. We're proud to have you on the show. It's been a pleasure working with you for this year. And uh, today is the day that you have chosen to tell this story, really for the first time publicly. So let's start first. Who is your abuser? Uh, senator Al Franken. So Al Franken, the senator from Minnesota. Now, the incident, as I understand it, took place prior to his uh, term in office. He wasn't in the Senate when this happened. Correct. Um, it was in 2006. Uh, we were uh, going on a USO tour. It was my ninth tour that I was going on, uh, my eighth to the Middle East. Uh, a lot of people who know me know I, I'm a big supporter of our troops. That's uh, something that's been my passion, my privilege for a long time. Um, my husband is currently a, a pilot in the Air Force. My dad served in Vietnam. So this is something that's always been, um, you know, everybody gets behind something. That's what they, they love to support and do. And, and something that has been my passion has been supporting the troops. So that's what I've always uh, given my time to. So uh, that particular year, um, uh, the sergeant major of the Army sponsor sponsored this tour, and uh, Al Franken was the, you know, one of the headliners of the tour, and I was going as the MC, and, uh, you know, I wasn't a singer or a dancer, so I go and MC since I'm a host, um, and since he wasn't a, a singer or a dancer, a musician, a Dallas Cowboy cheerleader that danced, he was also going to be a co-MC. Uh, so... That was the first time I'd ever gone on a tour where somebody was going to co-host with me. But since he was an actor on SNL, and that's how a lot of people knew him and a lot of the kids in the crowd knew him, uh, he decided to, he wrote, you know, he was also a writer on SNL. Yeah, principally. He wrote skits for himself to do, and he brought a lot of props, and, you know, he did a Saddam Hussein skit, which was actually very funny that the, the troops enjoyed. And he brought, you know, facial hair and stuff that the prop department from SNL gave him, he said, and stuff like that. But um, he, you know, when he introduced himself, when we met in Washington, D.C., before we all flew over, he said, oh, you know, I when I found out you were coming on this tour, I I wrote, a, a, you know, a little scene, if you if you will, with you in it, if you would like to do it with me, if you if you want to play along. 
And I said, you know, okay, fine, sure, that I'm game, you know, whatever. And um, he gave me the script, and, it, you know, it was full of sexual innuendos, and it was supposed to be funny, you know, because largely our military is young male men, and it, fine, okay, I can play along with that. And, of course, there was a uh, kissing scene that he wrote in for him to kiss me, and, um, you know, in my mind, it was never going to—I was never actually going to kiss Al Franken. Yeah, it was, it was a comedy kiss. Oh, right, exactly. I mean, it was like in the vein of Bob Hope, right? He was going to come at me. I was either going to turn my head or I would, I would, um, you know, cover his mouth or whatever. It was, it was like a gag thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so— Fine, whatever. So you're in, in country for, you're in theater for a couple of days. You you go around, you entertain the troops, you meet them in where they work, and you sign autographs and stuff. So the, the, the day of our first show in Kuwait is where we started out before we went further into Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, we were getting ready for our very first show. And so we're backstage, and because everybody else was either forward in the front of the the stage doing you know setting up or getting ready to do um you know waiting to go on or whatever al and i were backstage waiting to go on and we had a little makeshift backstage area um which basically was the gym for these troops um and they had a little place cordoned off for us and al came up to me and he's like well we we need to rehearse our kiss and i'm like yeah okay and i just blew him off you know because i'm thinking <laughs> We don't need to rehearse the kiss. I mean, we're doing a live, you know, 60-second skit in front of troops. We're not filming a movie, right? right? And so I blew him off because I didn't think he was serious. And then uh, he kind of said it again. He's like, well, we need to rehearse the kiss, Leanne. And I'm like, okay, Al, okay, you turn your head to the right. I'll turn my head to the right. Okay, we got this. And he actually got more... Um, Excuse me, I had to take a drink of water. I'm getting nervous. It's funny. <laughs> as I tell this, I'm, I'm getting worked up and I'm shaking. But um, as he, it, it reminded me, remember when we played the Harvey Weinstein when the, when the girl in New York actually wore the wire and we listened to him and the only audio we heard of Harvey Weinstein and he was very aggressive and yeah. very Insistent. Relent, relentless. Is just how go I, up to the room with me. Just go up. Just it, go up for five minutes. Yes, it was relentless. That's what I could hear in his voice, right? He started getting relentless. And I'm like, why is he insisting that we have to rehearse the damn kiss? I mean, it's just a, it's like a fake kiss, right? Yeah. This is all I could think about. I'm like, good God, Al, you know, it's just, it's not SNL for goodness sakes, right? We're not doing this thing for real. This is just a live thing in front of troops. It doesn't matter, you know? And he's like, Leanne, you know, actors, we have to rehearse everything. You have to rehearse the kiss. And just to make it go away and to make him stop, I'm like, okay, well, rehearse the damn kiss, you know? And it happened so fast that it, as I'm like, okay, we're going to rehearse the kiss, you know? And as we're coming in, and I come in towards him, you know, we rehearsed the line and the line leading up to the kiss. We rehearsed the line and I'm coming towards him and he comes up and he grabs me and he puts his hand behind my head and he aggressively comes in and he mashes his mouth up against mine and he sticks his tongue in my mouth. And as it happens, it happens so fast and he puts his tongue in my mouth and his mouth is just wet and slimy. And to this day, I call him fish lips, okay, <laughs> because it's disgusting. Ooh. And it's like, and how I describe it in my mind is like when a dog, when you're holding a treat for your dog, and I own a dog, and they're salivating while you're holding the treat. That's just what it reminds me well, of. Well, it's an incredible violation. Of course. And, and you know, my, my husband now was my boyfriend then. All I could think about is why would somebody do that? He's married. I've got a boy. You know, it was just, I was violated. I was disgusted. That's not what I was expecting. Uh, all I could think about was that's what you wrote that in the script for so you could do that. That to me, I was angry. I wanted to punch him in the face. I mean, now, was, so many things were going through my mind. Did you tell anybody about it? No, I did. No, you know why I didn't tell anybody about it? Because it was the first date of our tour. What was I going to say? What was I going to say? No, I'm going to go out and introduce everybody else on the tour and not do Al Franken's part. I'm not going to go on stage for those ten minutes when I'm standing next to him and he's the right. co-MC of the tour. So you I'm going to be the difficult one. You didn't report him to the USO rep or to the uh, the, the sergeant major. The sergeant Major of the Army? No. But you did tell 
some of the other well, cast I mean, members. Yes, and you know, and as that as you're going along, and you're you're in confined quarters. You know, you're all sort of, you know, you're not like you have your own room. It's not like you're in this luxury. You're yeah. not staying in a hotel. It's you're close quarters in, on a tour. In, yes, you're staying in bunk beds and quarters with the other girls on the tour, and you know, you don't want to be seen as the difficult one. You don't want to be the one that's. Uh, uh, you know, causing trouble. You're in a war zone, for goodness sakes. There's people that, that you're being shot at every day outside the wire. Right. So, so you're, you know, you're not, I'm not causing trouble. I'm a big, big girl. I can take care of myself. I told him, you ever do that to me again, you're going to get punched in the face or need in the, you know what. So, but a few minutes later, so you, you, you warned him, oh, said, I don't to, do that again. Don't ever do that to me again. Right. And I walked out. I found the nearest bathroom. I washed my mouth out because I was so disgusted. Right. I mean, I was like, how dare you? But a few minutes later, you're cued and you got to go on and perform the skit now in me, front of an audience. And let me tell you, people think, oh, you're in Hollywood. You're a TV host. You're a sportscaster. You're an actress. I'm like... I am not an actress, okay? That that's a whole different gift that people have. I've never claimed to be an actress. That's a whole that's a whole other set of talent, right? I had to act. Okay. I had to go out there and put on that smile yeah. and act like I like this guy and act like hey, Al Franken, ladies and gentlemen, and and put on the smile and do the skit. And you know, and let me tell you, I turned my head away every time. I I never I never was alone with him again for the rest of the tour. I made sure that I was never in, alone in a room or anything with him again. I uh, uh, never spoke to him um, voluntarily again. You know, we had to sit next to each other. They put us next to each other in autograph tables, and just because we were the two hosts, and I would always put my back to him. And How was he treating you after you did uh, after the backstage incident when he stuck his tongue in your mouth, mm -hmm. and then you rebuffed him, and you had to go out and and do the fake kiss scene, which you uh, didn't allow him to kiss you on stage. Mm -hmm. You turned your head. But now you're on the tour. What was his demeanor like with you in, in the intervening days? You know, it's like that passive aggressive thing. I mean, I'm sure every woman has ever dealt with this. If you've, uh, you know, rebuffed a guy, right? You, you're you in a bar and, and you're just hanging out with your girlfriend or you have a boyfriend and a guy hits on you and you're like, you know, no thanks, I'm not interested or I have a boyfriend or I'm married. And then, you know, a guy's been hitting on you for an hour and then you, you say, I'm not interested. And then all of a sudden you're you're the bitch or, you, you know, or you're fat and ugly anyways. I'm like, really? Okay, I'm just not interested. I'm sorry. And you're, you're the bad guy. You're, you're the one that's, you know, the evil woman. And it's like, it, you know, it was that passive aggressiveness the whole tour. We're sitting doing autograph sessions. Literally, there are times nobody's in his line because, let's face it, you know, n not that there's politics, but th there are people that are, you know, patriots that go on these tours that people love. And sometimes there are no people in his line. And I'd have people out the door that would either have my FHM magazine. And I could see out of the corner of my eye one time that one of my headshots kind of was like moving away. And I looked over and I looked down and and I looked down and he's like drawing on one of my pictures and I have devil horns and a goatee and the devil tail and a pitchfork. And I'm oh just thinking, God. really, this is what I'm dealing with? Al Franken's drawing me as the devil. I'm like, okay, I, like these are the little petty things I had to deal with for two weeks on the road. Now, the tour comes to an end. You do all the shows. Mm -hmm. You go into the combat zones. Mm -hmm. And it's Christmas Eve, and it's time to come back to L.A., right. and you're on a C-17 mm -hmm. about to make a 36-hour trip back to Los Angeles. Yes. It's You're exhausted. Uh, everybody's uh, burned out. Oh, been... We're sick. I mean, you, you get the desert crud, they call it. I mean, right. like I've lost my voice from talking. You're, you literally, you basically have the flu, and you feel like every bacteria and germ you, you're carrying back over. They call it the desert crud, literally. So um, you're trying to get as much sleep on the flight as possible. Oh, yeah. And when you land back in L.A., the unit photographer hands you a disc, a souvenir disc, mm -hmm of the photos from the trip and ev everybody gets a copy of the disc yeah because they had a photographer following everybody around so you get home and after recovering from the trip you pop the disc into your laptop to mm -hmm. take a look at the pictures and what did you discover well funny thing is so they take pictures of everyone and what happens is that you know they sort of take all these behind the scenes you know pictures and i open up my my photo disc and it's you know all the pictures from the tour and I get to the pictures finally at the end, you know, because they're sort of in chronological order. And the picture of me on the, you know, the pictures of us on the plane ride coming home, I'm sitting there up against the side of the plane. 
um, asleep, still in my Kevlar helmet and my and my flak vest, because when you're taking off from a war zone, there's always the chance that small arms fire, basically a machine gun, could hit you from underneath and pierce the skin of the airplane. So you wear your tactical gear still in the aircraft taking off. So, you know, in case you get shot through the plane that you still have, you know, protection. protection. Right. So I'm wearing that. And of course, I can fall asleep in that for nine hours. You know, I could probably wake up in Germany out of Bagram, Afghanistan and still be in my 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 gear because I'm asleep. And anybody that knows me knows I can sleep anywhere, anytime for a long period of time. And um, I see a picture and there's a picture of me sleeping in my gear on the plane. And there's Al Franken literally um, in the photo grabbing my boobs with his hands um, as if he's grabbing my breasts and looking at the camera and like smiling, laughing with this smirk on his face. And I'm like... <laughs> after everything that happened on this tour, you know, in context, I mean, just looking at the photograph by itself, if you didn't know anything else that happened, it's still a disgusting photo. By the way, the photo is posted now on our website at kbc.com. If you want to see uh, the picture of Al Franken uh, basically groping uh, Leanne Tweeden while, wear while she's wearing a flag. First time. So that was... The first part of Leanne Tweeden's uh, statement this morning on uh, her uh, radio station in Los Angeles. Al Franken married Franny Bryson October 2nd, 1975. They've been married ever since. You just don't do that. You just don't do that. I don't care if you think it, Al. You don't do it. You keep your hands to yourself, you keep your mouth to yourself. Show a little bit of respect. Even if you think impure thoughts, I'm not saying you, you don't have a right to think things, but you don't act upon your thoughts. And that's really what we're seeing here. The guy's been married since 1975. Um, he's still married today, 11 years after this incident happened. This occurred five, four, what, five, six months after he had already known he was going to run for U.S. Senate. This is a raw deal all around because all Al had to do was just be respectful for a change. Um, let's take a look at what our local TV coverage of this particular incident uh, was like this morning. WCCO 4 News starts now with breaking news. We start today with breaking news. A woman is accusing Senator Al Franken of sexually assaulting her. Leanne Tweeden says it happened during a USO tour in 2006. Now, this is a photo of the alleged incident. It was taken on the plane ride home from that tour and posted online today by Tweeden, who is now a radio host in Los Angeles. Pat Kessler is following this story for us and joins us now. And Pat, that photo is absolutely disturbing to look at. Yeah, it really is. There are a lot of people who are upset about this now. Leanne Tweeden says that Senator Franken forcibly kissed her during that USO tour in 2006. She says it happened during a rehearsal for a skit they later performed on stage. We rehearse the line and I'm coming towards him and he comes up and he grabs me and he puts his hand behind my head and he aggressively comes in and he mashes his mouth up against mine and he sticks his tongue in my mouth. Tweeden posted that account of the incident on Los Angeles radio station KABC. Later, she says, Franken posed for this photo while she slept in which he appears to be grabbing her breasts. Senator Franken issuing a statement this morning. He says, quote, I don't know what was in my head when I took that picture, and it doesn't matter. There's no excuse. I look at it now and feel disgusted. It isn't funny. It's completely inappropriate. It's obvious how Leanne would feel violated by that picture. Now, Republican Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said this morning he believes the allegations are credible, and he's asking the Senate Ethics Committee to review the matter. McConnell said that, quote, regardless of party, harassment and assault are completely unacceptable in the workplace or anywhere else. And just during the last few minutes, the head of the Republican Party here in Minnesota is calling on Senator Franken to resign. So this is a developing story that we're going to hear more and more about today. And it's interesting, I know you just reported in Reality Check last night that the U.S. Congress right. is one of the last bodies to implement uh, di sexual discrimination policy. Right, and now people are beginning to take a real close look at this in state capitals around the country.
country and in the U.S. Congress. So count on hearing about this for a long time. And possibly hearing of more women coming forward. Right. All right, Pat, thank you. So that's how it was reported this morning on WCCO-TV. And we're going to actually go right back to a second clip with Leanne Tweeden right now. First time I, I noticed, uh, I, I just mentioned when how you first joined the show, I had been invited to the Gary Shandling Memorial mm -hmm. here in L.A. And uh, I sat in the same row with Al Franken. And I just happened to mention, because I had a, a, a wacky experience with him years ago that was not his fault. It was Lorne Michaels, actually. <laughs> and I just mentioned that Al Franken was sitting in the same row. And when I mentioned his name, I did notice that you had this visceral reaction. Your face kind of contorted into distaste. And I said, I don't know what that is, but there's some story there somewhere. And it's interesting to me because you uh, have worked, you've been playing in the boys' sandbox most of your career. You've mm -hmm. been working in the modeling business, uh, in the sports arena as a host of Best Damn Sports Show, uh, the uh, Extreme Sports, Extreme Sports, sports. sports World. You've been around yeah, baseball sure. players in yeah. locker rooms. Has anybody else ever treated you like this? No. I, no. Nobody's ever come up and grabbed me and just stuck their tongue in my mouth and, and feel like they all could get away with it. soldiers you've been around, all the military bases? The soldiers have been the most well-behaved men I've ever been around in my life. Are you kidding me? They have a chain of command that they have to answer to. I've traveled with chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Sergeant Majors of the Army. I mean, we're talking about some of the most well-behaved because they know that they have to answer to people. Now, I mean, I, I think Al just thought... Uh, I don't have to answer to anybody. Now, uh, a couple weeks ago, we had Congresswoman Jackie Spear on the show. Mm -hmm. And this was another, you know, it's funny, when we do the show together, uh, I see things out of the corner of my eye. When we were talking to Congresswoman Spear, and she told her story about having uh, a, a tongue stuck in her throat in Congress when she was a staffer. And I saw you again have this you. reaction. I think I looked at you and I go... <laughs> yes. I, mean, I think I mouthed the words to you. I'm like, was it Hal? You know, I mean, it was just one of those things where I, I sort of, I, you know, I didn't have an epiphany, but I, I thought, oh, my gosh, it happened to her, too. And I think that that maybe I, I talked to you during the break. I said, it happened to her, too. You know, how many other people has it happened to? And maybe, you know, everybody's asking me, why now? Why, why, why now? And I said, you know what? OK, the tide has turned. So many people have come out. And I've wanted to tell this story because it's bugged me for so long. It's made me angry for so long. I've been humiliated for so long. My friends have known. My husband's known. You know, the people around me have known the story. My assistant knew the story. And everybody's like, oh, my gosh, are you going to show the picture? Are you going to finally talk about it? And it's like now's the time because what if there's somebody else he's done this to? What if somebody, I was inspired by Jackie Spear saying, you know what, this happened to me when I was a young 20-something being a congressional aide and that happened. If I'm talking about it, maybe somebody else it will feel like they can come out in real time and not hold it in for 10, 12, 20, 30, 50 years that some of these people are coming out 40 years later saying this happened to me when I was a teenager or whatever. You know, this now is the time. Don't don't wait don't hold it in you know we got to change the culture we got to change the silence what do you want from al franken i don't want anything from al franken this i'm you know i'm i don't want anything he he's had a chance i told you i've seen him since this happened he he knows exactly what he did he's had a chance to apologize i don't even want him to, if, if, if he feels like he wants to apologize to me he can do that that's fine i'll i'll, I'll take his apology um, I, I look, I, I, I'd have been long dead if I held my breath waiting for an apology from him for 11 years. OK, I've lived my life. I've I've moved on beyond that and past that. Um, he, he, he can apologize if he'd like to. But I, I don't need anything from Al Franken. I, <laughs> I've moved beyond. Now, if you notice, Al Franken actually did offer his pseudo apology today that was brought up in the WCCO segment. Um, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has uh, asked for a Senate Ethics Committee investigation. Uh, Democrat Major uh, Minority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer has also asked for that. Al Franken has actually agreed with that. Um, so you have all of, you know all three of them uh, have come out and said that there's going to be an investigation. Now there's one other thing that's going to be really, really interesting to see. And that is the fact that here in Minnesota, 
State Senator Dan Schoen, D uh, Democrat, and State Representative uh, Tony Cornish, Republican, are also facing investigations over uh, sexual harassment allegations. Here is today's front page of the Pioneer Press. Dayton discusses harassment cases. Now, I know this text is a little bit hard to read, this section right here. So I'm going to read it here for you. Governor has called for two lawmakers facing allegations to resign. Uh, in his first public remarks about the growing sexual harassment scandal sweeping through the Capitol, Governor Mark Dayton said Wednesday that though sexual harassment is a pervasive problem through society, quote, there should be consequences, swift and consistent consequences. The comments came in response to a reporter asking about how to change the culture that uh, many have cited as allowing men to act in inappropriate or worse ways toward women they have power over. So that is what's happening within the Capitol for state legislators. It's going to be interesting to see what happens now that the same types of allegations are brought against U.S. Senator Al Franken, a fellow Democrat with Mark Dayton. I uh, have no idea exactly what Dayton's thoughts are on the matter. Uh, Senator Klobuchar, also a Democrat, has come out and made the statement that, uh, and this is earlier this morning, I don't know uh, if she's revised it or not, um, she's essentially made the statement, I'm just waiting to hear what Al Franken has to say regarding the matter, and then, you know, that was made before he made a statement. I don't know of any revision there. The, the fact is, if sexual harassment in and of itself is a bad thing which I believe it is and if it should not be tolerated Al Franken needs to resign Judge Roy Moore in uh, Alabama needs to step down as a candidate and anybody else in Washington for that matter needs to go this is a nonpartisan issue it's a bipartisan issue whichever way you want to look at it you know um, We've seen Larry Craig, Republican senator from uh, Idaho. He had to leave um, over similar types of allegations. But yet we've seen Vice President Biden have his hands over, inappropriately over people all over the place and there was no incident. Yet at the same time, Harvey Weinstein, you know, he gets prosecuted being in Hollywood, friend of the Clintons. And once that tree was shaken on uh, pedophile, uh, pedophilia, of course, all the other pedophiles are now getting shaken up. This is, what we're seeing now is a political shakeout from people on both sides. It's going to be interesting to see how this is handled. I mean, Al Franken's already admitted it. All right, that's the first starting point. He's not being defiant about it. Uh, but now exactly what's going to happen. Is Franken going to step down? Or is he just going to do a delaying tactic and then try to fight for a seat? If he does step down, who is Dayton going to appoint to uh, replace him? I cannot for the life of me remember if, the, if an appointment would be until the next election, which would be uh, November of 18, and then a special election then held to, uh, for the remainder of the term through 2020, or if that candidate just goes on and completes the term and then there's, you know, real I can't remember how that law is written in Minnesota. Uh, not that it matters. So Franken can either continue to fight for a seat, he can resign, Dayton can appoint, a whole thing could blow over. Um, they could have the censure, if there is a censure, after the next election and then forced resignation. I, I don't know how this is going to play out. I honestly don't. Uh, but here's what we've seen so far from the MNGOP uh, on their reaction to the allegation against Franken. I mean, uh, I have not yet seen a statement from Ken Martin, the Democrat Party chair. Uh, I haven't seen anything from Al Franken. We did get Klobuchar's statement that she's waiting for Franken's statement. So let's hear what the uh, state Republican Party leaders have to say. May I ask, while we've had this conversation here this morning, some very serious allegations have come out against Senator Al Franken. And uh, most of you have probably seen it by now. There's a picture of him appearing to grope a woman. And I need to get your reactions to that on a national level. Uh, if they're serious enough, should he resign? I will say sexual harassment anywhere, in any form, in any place is unacceptable. And I think we as elected officials need to stand together. It's not a partisan issue. We need to stand together uh, to, to send a clear message that that sort of behavior is unacceptable. Um, I do also, I don't know the details about Senator Franken. Um, and, and we've obviously 
have been busy uh, in our meeting here, um, but uh, I certainly do believe that people are uh, deserve a due process, and, and we certainly want to make sure that we don't jump to any conclusions. But uh, it is uh, what I the little bit that I have heard is very concerning. <laughs> Deep in the uh, committee uh, discussions, all I saw was the, uh, the the picture on my phone. I didn't read anything. Uh, both the speaker and I have met about this. We know that it's very very important that we take serious action on this issue. It's, it's a light that's being shined all over the country, and overall I think that's a good thing. Uh, and so we're looking at our processes. You know, as far as Senator Franken, I don't want to comment because I haven't even read the article. Uh, but every time we need to look at every case seriously. I mean, there's no uh, exception to that. I've met with Senator Bach as well a couple of times on this. Uh, I will tell you the Senate has good practices in place. We already had a December sexual harassment meeting planned and a February one. Uh, that was pre any of this uh, because it's something that we all uh, view as very important. But I'll also say that we're looking at can we be better? And uh, I think we all can be better. And the light being shined on this nationally, I think, is overall a good thing. Senator Gazelka, you said you have not read the article, but you said that you saw the photo. What was your first reaction when you saw the picture? An incredible disappointment. I mean, if you think about, uh, in fact, I don't want to go farther than that because there is a due process that you have to have, and every one of these cases uh, has its own merits. But anything that's true is just unbelievably unacceptable. We should all stand against. I wonder if any of you could answer this. Senator Franken came out today with a statement saying that he doesn't recall the incident of groping and inappropriately kissing. And as for the photo that's been released, he says that it was meant to be a joke, that it wasn't, and that. He shouldn't have done it. This is a statement that came out within the past hour and a half. Uh, can I get reaction to what you make of that? Sure. You know, I, I find it pretty troubling. The, the photo is pretty troubling when you see it. And, and, you know, I think to say that sexual harassment is a joke, I, I think, trivializes what is a crime and, and, and trivializes victims. And I, I, I find that deeply troubling. I, I, I think that that's part of the problem. We can't, we can't call sexual harassment a joke. Um, it's not a joke. It's a serious issue, and we need to stand strong and firmly against sexual harassment. Leader Pepin, can we get your thoughts on that? Well, thank, thank you for asking. <laughs> I appreciate it. As the female standing up here, I appreciate that. You know, all the accusations are extremely troubling. I believe that no one should have to be in fear when they go to work that they're going to be harassed. And, uh, but I also believe everybody deserves due process. And if these you know, allegations are found to be true, I think serious action needs to be taken. And certainly across the country, I think... Um, this issue has come to light, and I think we have to wake up as a country and, and uh, you know, make serious changes to our culture, not only here, but through many other legislatures, Washington, D.C., Hollywood, it's all over the place. And um, as Speaker Doubt said, these allegations are no joke. A picture of somebody, that picture is no joke. It's, um, it's never funny when somebody touches you and it's an unwanted, or it says something to you that it's unwanted. Um, people shouldn't have to deal with that, and um, so it'll be an interesting process going forward, but uh, everybody has to, I, I'm looking forward to the fact that we're doing the, the training. I think it's an important reminder for everyone. We do it for staff as well. And uh, I hope people wake up and realize that this is a problem and, and they need to make sure they behave in a professional place. And I would, I would hope that would be the case not only in the legislature, but in workplaces across the country. Uh, we need to treat people with respect regardless of who they are. I'm Norm now, since we started the show today, uh, we started taping, the Pioneer Press did come up with a story on some reactions. Uh, some of the people I was asking about reactions, I actually have them now. Uh, so from Jennifer Carnahan, chair of the Republican Party of Minnesota, she said, quote, Today's allegations of sexual harassment committed by Senator Al Franklin are deeply disturbing. Based upon these accusations and the accompanying photographic evidence, I am calling on Senator Franklin to resign his Senate seat. The people of Minnesota deserve better representation than this in the United States Senate. Al Franken's weak, equivocating apology isn't going to cut it. To quote Senator Franken just yesterday, sometimes when you don't get a joke, it's because it wasn't a joke. Senator Amy Klobuchar. This should not have happened to Leanne Tweeden. I strongly condemn this behavior and the Senate Ethics Committee must open an investigation. This is another example of why we need to change work environments and reporting practices across the nation, including in Congress. Uh, Congresswoman Betty McCollum uh, from St. Paul. Uh, the Senate Ethics Committee should conduct a formal inquiry into the disturbing allegations made against Senator Franken. The accountant photo released today can only be described as completely inappropriate. Governor Mark Dayton, uh, Democrat and former U.S. Senator. 
as well as you know, the current governor. Uh, I was shocked to hear these reports this morning. I will defer to the U.S. Senate Ethics Committee to investigate and act on this matter. I know from serving in the Senate that the committee has a well-established and highly respected process for reviewing situations like this and making the right decisions. Uh, Tammy Baldwin, U.S. Senator from Wisconsin, Democrat, uh, said in a statement that she's glad to see that Senator Franken immediately apologized. Quote, this kind of behavior isn't okay, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. I fully support an ethics committee investigation. Angie Craig, who is a Democrat who ran against uh, Jason Lewis in the uh, second congressional district and who has already announced that she's running again, she made her statement, quote, as of today I have donated $15,000 in campaign contributions received from Senator Franken during the 2016 and 18 election cycles to 360 communities in Burnsville. Uh, 360 Communities is the organization, which operates sexual assault survivor services, domestic violence shelters, and food shelves for our neighbors, Craig said in a statement. And then Iowa State Representative Abby Finkenauer uh, received a contribution from Franken, and she made the following statement. Leanne Tweeden's account of her experiences with the senator are clearly sexual assault, not a joke, and she is incredibly brave for speaking out. I've decided to donate Senator Franken's donation to my campaign to the Riverview Center, a nonprofit in Iowa that helps individuals affected by sexual assault. So those are actually the statements made from uh, Republicans and Democrats, more Democrats in here, all condemning Al Franken's behavior. Um, Al Franken's behavior actually was brought up uh, in the 2008 uh, election campaign. And we're going to show you right now uh, an ad that was run by Senator Norm Coleman, his uh, Franken's opponent at the time, called Angry L. I'm Norm Coleman, and I proved this message because I thought it was important for you to see it. You are wrong, and you have to apologize, man. How shameless these people are. These people are so shameless. Bull. Now, that fact, is such baloney. I f hate those right wing mother. F I'm mean sometimes. You are wrong and you have to apologize, man. So, what we're seeing with Al Franken, it's not a surprise. It's been out there. I mean, it's probably more surprising that it came out on a USO tour. Uh, I'm surprised that this kind of stuff hasn't come out by now. But. You know, as we've seen with uh, Harvey Weinstein, Weinstein, Weinstein uh, out of Hollywood, I mean, this is this is the shakedown. But this is stuff that you got to be treated seriously. Now, I noticed that, you know, the state Republican Party chair Jennifer Carnahan, of course, comes out and says he needs to resign. Every state party chair says that. If a Republican, if Jason Lewis would have been uh, mentioned doing the same thing, Ken Martin would be the first one out there saying that he's got to resign. Biggest thing, of course, is due process. And so the Senate investigation, the Senate Ethics Committee is going to come out and do their investigation as well they should. Uh, there's already one other person, uh, I can't remember her name, Melanie Morgan, uh, who was a radio host from uh, KSFO in San Francisco. She has uh, admitted that Franken harassed her. We're going to hear more about that. I'm sure there's a lot of other people going to come out. And this is going to be an ongoing story. That's just the way it goes. But as we have uh, 38 more shopping days left until Christmas, we are actually going to leave you with a little bit of music, and it's the music we did not get to last week. So here is the President's Own United States Marine Band with the Marine Corps Hymn. Dallas Pearson producer. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're watching North Star Oasis. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.